So we're returning to the book of Romans this morning after a few weeks away from the book of Romans. And this is the book that we've lived in for the last few years. And I realize that we have people coming to visit and people coming in to our congregation even over the last few weeks. So I'll, by way of remind you, reminder, remind you of where it is that we have been. In Romans, Paul is writing to believers about the gospel that is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's Romans 1.16. And it is the power of God for salvation, he tells us in the very next verse, 117, because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And you might be hearing that and wondering, well, why is that the power of God for salvation? Well, it is, and it is good news being called the gospel because apart from faith in Christ and his finished work at the cross as proclaimed in the gospel, what Paul goes on to tell us there in the opening chapter of Romans is that the wrath of God remains against all men. And it remains against all men because he gets to the point where he tells us in chapter 3, verse 10, that all men are unrighteous. And that as a result of the wrath of God remaining on you because you're unrighteous, you're actually in bondage to sin, whether you realize you're bondage to sin or not. Man being unrighteous is the just recipient of God's wrath. And it's evident, he tells us in 118, because man suppresses the truth. The truth has been revealed. Man says that's not true and suppresses it, contorts it. He tells us in 120 that Man denies God as he has revealed himself. He tells us in 123 he doesn't honor God and he worships created images of God and he's exchanged the truth of God for a lie in 123. Having shown us then that man's unrighteous and man is in a desperate condition before God in Romans 1 through 3, Paul shows us where that righteousness that you desperately need is found. He tells us in chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, it's apart from the law. It's not found in keeping the law, but it's found through faith in Christ. And then you get that verse, chapter 5, verse 1, where he says the Christian is justified by faith, having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you're justified. And so all of this sort of encompasses where we've been, and all of this is necessary to see where we're going this morning. Where we've been, Romans 1 through 3, the need for the gospel, then Romans 4 through 11, the power of the gospel that's doing this work of saving us, and that's evident, and it's liberating us from our sin, it's justifying us, it's adopting us, it's uniting us, it's sanctifying us, and it's preserving us. And then where we've been, Romans 12, where we've been able to see the transforming work of the gospel in the totality of our lives as believers. Verse 1, you present your life as a sacrifice to God. Chapter 12, verse 2, you prove the will of God. Verses 3 through 5, you prioritize the people of God. 6 through 8, you practice the gifts of God. 9 through 13, you project the love of God. And in those remaining verses, you see how the Christian produces the character of God within our lives. The point of all of that is this. There is genuine transformation that's evident within the Christian's life. You see tangible evidence of fruit in the Christian's life. The gospel has transformed the Christian, transforming your life, your will, your family, your service, your affections, your character, and even your relationships with those within the church, those outside of the church, and those that hate you outside of the church. And when you think about where Paul has brought us to in Romans 1 through 12, you would think, well, this has now encompassed everything where he's described how we've been affected. But he gives us something else here in Romans 13, that this even affects the way a Christian goes about their life as a citizen under a system of government, that this bears witness of a heart that's been transformed by the gospel of grace, that how we understand and how we respond to and speak about and interact with civil authorities has been impacted revealing here the power of the gospel unto salvation. This reveals that you have actually been freed from your sin, you've been made alive from the dead, you have eyes to see, you have ears to hear. And, and, and this shows how those who have been saved to another kingdom live as sojourners in the kingdom that God has sovereignly placed you under during your stay on earth. It tells you how we're to live here. In, in all of this, this transformed heart is evident. 
the heart transformed by the gospel. Now, I think it's providential that we come to Romans 13 today. Because what do you have in one week ahead of you? Your taxes are due, right? I don't know. I hope you knew that. I hope that didn't come as a surprise to you. But maybe even more weighty than that, think about your, what you're one week removed from. The president issuing a proclamation on Transgender Day of Visibility in 2024 in which he called on you, dear citizen, to join his administration in, quote, lifting up the lives and voices of transgender people throughout our nation and to work toward eliminating, listen, violence and discrimination based on gender identity. That would be including you, not only as citizens, but you as a Christian in your thinking and approaching and applying biblical truth to the issue. That would be violence and discrimination based on what this says applying a biblical anthropology to about how it is that God has created man and called him to live. And and many of you know this. He even signed this abomination on Good Friday and included in this document that Romans 1 exchanges the truth of God for a lie and worships and serves the creature rather than the creator, signed it and dated it with those words in the year of our Lord. So the question before us is, how does a Christian, transformed by the gospel, live under a president, prime minister, a king, a queen, a mayor, a governor? How how do you live if you're in a prison under a prison guard and, and you've been transformed and made alive as a prisoner? How do you live if you're in the military and you have a drill sergeant over you? How do you live if you've been called to go into the middle of nowhere South America into a village that nobody's contacted forever and there's a tribal leader that's there? What Paul instructs here isn't bound by a zip code. It's not bound by a date on a calendar. And he tells us how we're to live. Look at Romans 13. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they have opposed, and, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes." For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Paul is is showing us here, and this is what we'll be looking at, that the transformation wrought by the gospel of grace Upon you, the Christian, if you're a Christian, that it's so extensive that it's even evidenced in how the Christian relates to civil authorities. To say it a bit differently, that the Christian's salvation, what we've been looking at there in Romans 3 through 11, faith alone, Christ alone, for righteousness, justification, adoption, union, sanctification, everything that comes with your redemption that it has so affected our life, our will, our relationships to others, that's Romans 12, life transformed by the gospel, it's also affected our relationships with civil authorities, giving the evidence of the fruit of our lives submitting to God. It's because of this gospel thing here that you're free to submit, to submit to the governing authorities in the day and the place in which you live, and to submit to the absolute authority. And this act of submission that Paul is commanding here, Romans 13, 1, is an act of faith. And being an act of faith that shows forth the power of the gospel from the heart of the believer, transformed by grace, and as a result of acting in faith, it brings glory to God who is worthy of our submission. And from all of this comes forth from Paul's 
very intentional instructions here in Romans 13 about the Christian's relationship to civil authorities that tells us how we're to relate to government, to those in authority over us, kings, presidents, governors, constables, mayors, whenever through history. Ask the text the question, let it answer the question. How does a believer embracing the gospel, committed to God, following Jesus, desiring to glorify God with your life, how do you conduct yourself in relation to the government? What does the normal, usual, common relationship between believers and civil authorities, what does it look like? Number one, Paul gives you the instruction. And the instruction is this, submit to authority. Verse one. The heart here transformed by the gospel leads to the Christian subjecting himself to the civil authorities in this world. Verse 1, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. So what's the instruction? Instruction is the imperative from Paul here. Imperative, kind of a command. It is a command to be in subjection. Hupotasio, subject, subordinate. Imperative here, saying that there's strength behind what he's saying. You must be in subjection. You must be subordinate to. In the sense, as we're thinking that, the sense of the word subordination, subordinate, isn't so much just go and obey. That's implied with the word here, but it's a call to submit. It's a call to submit, and in your submission, to be able to recognize two things. Yourself as a subordinate in the hierarchy, and recognize that there are actually others who have been placed in authority over you. You see those two sides. You're, you're recognizing your place, and you're recognizing the place of others. Now look at the recipients of the instruction here. Be subject. Who is to be subject? Every person. It's the responsibility of every person to be subject to the governing authorities. The literal sense in which this is laid out in the Greek is all souls. All souls. So, at the very beginning of all this, we need to be clear. What he's saying here applies to who? You and me. There's really no Christian that could possibly imagine themselves to be exempt from Paul's instructions. You must submit. Now, the object here to which the instructions and the recipient relate and apply, look, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Two words in the Greek, governing being those who have risen above or who are higher, that's the sense, and authorities being those who have a right to control or govern over a domain or sphere over which they exercise power which has been given to them. In the second half of the verse, he's going to tell you who gave them the power. But they've been given power to exercise this authority. So the text, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. So the Christian life here is one whose ordinary existence demonstrates a humble submission to the civil authorities in the world in which you live. And that recognizes what we just said. I'm a subordinate. There's an authority that's been placed over me that has control. So we, as we look at that, that Paul's talking about submission shouldn't be all that surprising to us when you think about the totality of New Testament teaching as it regards submission. Emphasizing submission here makes sense because submission is a normal characteristic of the Christian life. Every Christian is submitting in some sort of a way. You can turn there if you want to Ephesians 5. And we'll go through a number of these because I want you to see this. Remember in Ephesians, we see that word subject a number of times. Ephesians 5, verse 21, to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So there's a sense in which he's talking about our relationships to one another as believers, that they express something of submission, that we look at each other and go, you are more important than I am. And that affects our relationship with one another. And in the very next verse, you're familiar with this. Christian wives, be subject to your own husbands. And then, but as the church is subject to Christ, that comes just a little while after that. And that's a given. He's saying that as though you know this Christian, you're a Christian, Christ is the Lord. You submit yourself to him and all that he said. He says, even as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. If you turn to Hebrews 13, 17, Christians in a church are instructed to submit to their leaders. Why? For they keep watch over your souls. 
That's, that's a characteristic that's to exist within the local church amongst believers. Submission. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Peter's there instructing younger Christians, be submissive to your elders. Why would he do that? Well, if you're a younger Christian, you might be wondering that. If you're an older Christian, you might go, oh, I think I know why he does that. Because our temptation is not to be in submission. You come to Titus 2.9 and 1 Peter 2.18. And the instructions are the same there. Christian slaves, be subje- in subjection to your masters. And he doesn't say, only if your masters are Christians, then you be in subjection to them. He doesn't say that. This is just the normal course of your life. Over and over again, those instructions show up in the New Testament that the Christian is to demonstrate submission, a submission that is providing something of a glimpse of the way in which you submit to Christ your Lord. Ephesians 1.22, we get the sense of him being over all things. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. So our lives as believers reflect submission to Christ in such a way. So if the the Christian heart then shows itself radically changed, profoundly beautiful by the power of the gospel, and therefore by the way in which it submits in all these other areas, it's really no surprise that Paul is instructing us to submit to those who have been placed in authority over us in this world, and he's not saying only if they're a Christian. He essentially urges the same thing you'll remember when he's writing to Titus in Titus 3.1, saying, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. You remember Peter echoes the same call, writing to saints there with persecution from civil authorities on the horizon. 1 Peter 2.13, he says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, <clears throat> whether to a king as one in authority or to governors as sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. So that's the teaching of Scripture, that, that there's a submission that's to be displayed within your life. I'll just ask you that. Think about what you've just heard. Think about the text. Does your life, Christian, does your life reflect an overall humble submission to the governing authorities having been sovereignly placed over you in the day and age in which you live? Now you go, I'm thinking about that. I wonder if that would be indicative of me. My guess is you could probably ask your children or your spouse, and they would give you an answer fairly quickly, right? You could ask your coworker, and they have a sense of whether you demonstrate within your life submission to the authorities that have been placed over you. What would your social media feeds say? If we went and we looked at that and what you're talking about and what what, what you're blasting out on social media, would it be reflective of what you see here, or those people who follow you say. But I also wonder this, what about the new Christian growing in faith, looking to you as a more mature Christian example? Would you be modeling for them what Paul is calling for here, humble submission that demonstrates faith to what the Word of God is calling us to? What, what obstacles would be preventing you from submitting? What is it that remains in you tempting you to resist instead of submit? Well, well, if we think about that, what's in us that might not be, might be in the way from causing us to be able to follow Paul's instructions right here, I think it's the very same thing that keeps us from submitting in any sort of an area of our life. A, a number of things. One would be faith. Paul is calling for it. A number of places within the text are saying this. Do you believe this or not? Do you believe this is how a Christian is supposed to live? But we could also say an obstacle would be the presence of pride and the absence of humility in our life, pride that's lusting for power and resisting any sort of authority or any sort of an order where you don't occupy the highest position. The obstacle there is of our own self-centeredness, that you would rather be served than to serve, that, that you're bitter and jealous and envious and that you seek only after what's for your own good instead of thinking about the good of others. The obstacle could be there of the lack of self-control, the lack of self-control. Proverbs 25.8 says, like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. That's the kind of a spirit that resists authority. 
You remember self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22. And maybe that's why it is that before Peter urges the saints there with persecution on the horizon to submit to kings and authorities, that he tells them in chapter 1, verse 13, prepare your minds for action, keep sober, fix your hope completely on the grace brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Prepare your minds. Be in control because you have the capacity to be in control because the Spirit lives in you and produces that fruit within you. I think this points us towards why it is that Paul is writing Romans 13, 1 to Christians then. You, you can't so much echo this to the whole world and say, hey, this is the way in which we're to live. The reason he says this to Christians because he's talking about the gospel is because of the gospel. Because all of those obstacles I just mentioned to you that may be the reason that you're a little uncomfortable with this text right here, all those obstacles can be removed. You're no longer a slave to pride. You're no longer a slave to self-centeredness, a lack of self-control, of bitterness, of lusting for power, of resentment, of anger. They no longer have the final say over you. You're dead to sin. That's why he says this in Romans 13, and he doesn't say this in Romans chapter 1, because he's showing you the path forward. You're submitting here, whether wives to husbands, slaves to masters, Christians to church leaders, even Christians to civil authorities, demonstrates you have freedom from your sin, and that freedom is found through Christ. Why is this so important? That he's saying, saying what he's saying here in a book that's been talking about the gospel up to this point. Well, a number of scholars and historians think Paul is instructing Christians in Romans 13 Because around this time, the Roman historian Tacitus records resistance against the payment of indirect taxes, a resistance that is going to eventually lead to an all-out revolt a few years later. And part of this is thought to be tied to Nero having considered repealing indirect taxes. That'd be like sales taxes, taxes on goods and services, those sorts of things. But the senators were dissuading him from doing that, fearing that, oh, if you repeal the indirect taxes, people are going to want you to repeal the direct taxes, and we can't have that take place. So as the people got word of this, it caused there to be a revolt. And while the whole Roman world here may be growing in their anger because of all this and beginning to revolt in fury, Paul is urging Christians, you don't act like that. No, you submit, and you can submit because you've been redeemed. Your hope isn't in this world. And and, and think about what's going on here. While that may be the context, the principle Paul is instructing carries forth throughout generations where Christians have found themselves in all sorts of regimes Christians in rural Africa and urban China taking the gospel to tribesmen in rainforest or even those who've come to faith in prisons or in the military. You live in an ordered world. There is a hierarchy. There are subordinates and there are those that are in authority. How do you live? Verse 1, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. So again, we've looked at this as we've gone throughout the whole book of Romans. We've considered this in the past. Paul is not giving you Christian He's not giving you an instruction in which you're completely unable to respond to. But you have been freed from your sin, and you've been freed to submit and to show forth that sort of a freedom that's found in the gospel of grace by how you interact with those authorities over you. Now watch. Watch verse 1. So the instruction comes in the first half of verse 1, the reason in the second half. So number 2 is the reason. And the first reason that he gives us here in the second half is this, that this recognizes divine authority, that this recognizes divine authority. What's the reason? For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. He's answering the question, why would I submit to governing authorities? For there is no authority except from God. There is no rogue authority. However much you may think it exists, there is no rogue authority. No rogue king, no rogue president, no rogue mayor. Whether you're in a tribe somewhere or you're in a palace somewhere, no authority here except from God. You may even live in a democracy, having the unique privilege afforded to few throughout history to elect your leaders, but even the majority choosing isn't the origin of power for governing authority of who's been chosen So democratic elections, they're not the exception to what Paul is saying here. 
A sovereign God is sovereign over all authorities. Only God has absolute rule, absolute authority over all, so that whoever may occupy the position of civil authority, it's not outside of his scope, not outside of his reach, not outside of his sphere, remember the word authority, not outside of his domain. He possesses the highest authority. He possesses the absolute authority. What is Paul doing? Where is he coming up with this? Well, in a sense, he's summarizing what you find in the Old Testament. God is the absolute authority, even over other authorities, whether they're good or evil. When a prisoner named Joseph, a slave, was raised to a position of great power over all of Egypt, it was because of Genesis 39-2, the Lord was with Joseph. It was the Lord, David says, 1 Chronicles 28-4, that chose him from all the house of his father to be king over Israel. And 1 Samuel 9, 17, it was the Lord who chose the king before him. The king before him, his choosings there in that text I just referenced, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, behold, the man of whom I spoke to you, this one shall rule over my people. So even Saul, You have David, even Saul, even Saul who disobeys God, even Saul who attempts to kill David, even Saul who seeks a woman who is a medium to talk to the dead, to be able to give him instruction, even Saul who's going to fall on his own sword to die, even Saul, this one shall rule. The God who chose Saul is the God who tells David in 2 Samuel 12, 8, I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. In Isaiah 45.1 conveys the same truth, opening with those words. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings. Years then before it happens, the Lord says he's going to take Cyrus, a Persian monarch, not even a worshiper of Yahweh, to gather Israel back to the land for his own purpose. One commentator said, Cyrus' whole career is managed in the hand of God. Remember Daniel, in his day, under the reign of another pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, in in turn there, Daniel chapter 2, under Nebuchadnezzar, in Daniel 2.21, he blessed the God of heaven, saying those words, it is he who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. Why is Daniel under this king? God has established him. It's a time in which I've been called to live. In Daniel 2.37, if you see that text, to this heathen king of authority of his day, Daniel says these words, You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beast of the field, or the birds of the sky... He has given them into your hand and caused you to rule over them. If you flip over a couple of chapters to Daniel 4, 17, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream and he's recounting it to Belshazzar. And he says this, The Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. Remember what Belshazzar says. He says, this dream that you just had is actually a lesson from God that's going to be revealed to you in 424. He's making known to Nebuchadnezzar, you're about to learn a lesson and you're to recognize, look at 425, that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. You know another way you can say that? No authority except from God, those which exist are established by God. That's the lesson for Nebuchadnezzar. I think the question that we're getting from Romans 13 is, Christian, have you learned that lesson? Look there in Daniel 4, verse 30. That lesson comes, remember, as Nebuchadnezzar's walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon. He's looking out at that magnificent scene that's unfolding there before him. And in reflection, he says those words, is this not Babylon the great, which... I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty. What's missing from that? A realization that there's no authority except from God and those which exist are established by God. And so to prove that that's true, God has the ruler 
of Babylon look like a beast and graze like a cow for a period of time. And when he learns the lesson, what does Nebuchadnezzar confess? Daniel 4, I think verse 34, he confesses about God, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Then Nebuchadnezzar says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, honor the king of heaven, for all of his works are true, his ways are just. He's able to humble those who walk in pride. I wonder if after elections people have echoed those words, What have you done? Nebuchadnezzar learned the lesson. And what was required for him to learn the lesson that God is the one who has absolute authority and everything is taking place by his plan? What was required was he had to have humility. He had to have humility to know that there is a God who is sovereign over all things. I think you can sum up what Nebuchadnezzar learned with no authority except from God and those which exist are established by God. Even the evil ones, Nebuchadnezzar, even the evil ones. If you go to the end of the book, Revelation 13 John describes the beast coming up out of the sea, bringing destruction. When you read that account, you find that the power that he's going to possess is given to him, and it's given to him for a, only a time. Even the evil ones. In his book, City of Man, Kingdom of God, Jesse Johnson writes, God temporarily allows evil to progress because he is using the brokenness of our world for his own greater purpose, purposes we cannot see in the present. It's only looking back that you see a glimpse, and you get only glimpses in some sort of a sense. It's only looking back in, in the book of Acts and seeing what wicked governments are doing in Jerusalem that we see that this is what the Lord is using to send Christians out of Jerusalem in the book of Acts to go forth into the Roman Empire with the gospel. And then it's only looking back throughout the, the book and, and looking back throughout church history that we see the Lord using evil authorities like Nero to even send them out of the Roman Empire into the whole of the world. From our limited perspective, all of this looks like chaos. Everything looks like it's out of control. How could this happen? But one day the Lord's going to turn the tapestry over and that what we have seen to this point is only these threads intersecting with one another and knots that's like how does this even make sense but he's going to turn it all over and you're going to see the intricacy of his design and all of his purposes being fulfilled exactly as he had planned but till that day but till that day his word has showed us that he is the absolute authority and he is in absolute control and the question for us is do we believe him are we going to act like we believe him? Are we going to act like he is in control? Speak like that. Think like that. Submitting to the governing authorities is an acknowledgement that there is a God in heaven who is in authority over all. A God who orders, who has a design, who has a will, who has a purpose, who has a plan. A God who has appointed and instituted human governments to carry out that plan, whether they be good or whether they be bad. So that the person in authority over you is all part of his providential design to accomplish his purposes. And you're submitting, you're submitting yourself as Paul is instructing as an act of faith to the absolute authority because you're a Christian. This is because your heart's change. This is because you've been freed from sin. So then note, note the truths that Paul is giving us. God has absolute authority. All authority is derived from God. God is the reason authority exists. Every person is subject to subject themselves to the authority. That's the doctrine. Verse one, the first half, the command. Second half, the reason for the command. Now the question that you're wrestling with, I suspect, do we as Christians submit in an absolute sense to governing authorities over us? Meaning, do we submit to whatever they say? And let's just answer that from Scripture because it directs all submission. If you go to Exodus chapter 1, there's lots of places we could answer this from Exodus but if you just look in Exodus chapter 1, you'll remember there in those opening verses of the book that the king of Egypt has directed the Hebrew midwives to put baby boys born to Hebrew women to death. 
This is the way that they're going to control the Hebrews, eliminate the Hebrew population, and have them flow into the Egyptian population and in their Hebrew problem. But the response to that decree coming forth from the king comes in verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. You don't murder what God has fearfully and wonderfully made. You don't murder what's been made in the image of God. They submitted first and foremost to God. Look at that, those words, feared God. That's what triumphed over fearing the king. That they had been in submission to the king. I can submit, I can submit, I can submit. I understand this. But this, this is, this is against what God says. So they feared God, did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded And what's implied in this is that they were right. Second place I'll take you, turn back to Daniel 3, and you're very familiar with this. Daniel 3, he's already introduced you in Daniel 1 to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, sons of Judah, who'd been given, think about that, given new names by government officials, and by all accounts, there's no rejection of that. They're not saying, hey, you don't have a right? How dare you give me a new name? And you think, well, there's no way I'd I'd accept that. Well, that's because your government's given you a number instead of a name, right? Anyways, you get to Daniel 3, and you realize, oh, there is a problem that's come up here. Nebuchadnezzar the king makes the image of gold, chapter 3, verse 1, then issues the command that the moment you hear the horn throughout the land, you fall down and worship the golden image. And if you don't, chapter 3, verse 11, you're cast into the furnace of blazing fire. Eventually, it's brought to the king's attention, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're disregarding the command. They don't worship the God of Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 3, verse 12. No surprise, the king isn't happy. Somebody is resisting his authority. And like a king having authority, what does he do? Daniel 3, 15, he gives them an ultimatum. Now, if you are ready at the moment you hear all this music to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well, but if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands. And one of my favorite scriptures is what they say next. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. The answer is going to take place itself. They don't have to say anything, right? If it be so, 317, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we're not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. The truth is in them that their God has absolute authority and all authority derived is derived from God and is the result of his having authority and any other authority that exists is from him. That's what formulates their bold and brilliant reply here. Would you just think about what they don't do? They don't look at the king and say, can't do that. You don't have authority. They don't, they don't deny that they're refusing to submit to his will, and they don't deny that this is likely going to mean their lives. Why? Because we'll get to this next week. The king bears the sword. But what's driving their decision is this. They cannot refuse the command of the king who possesses absolute authority. The Lord God who said in Exodus 20 verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not worship them or serve them. What's that word in Hebrew for worship? to bow down. Worship's reserved only for Yahweh, and that comes as a command from Yahweh himself. You you know the account. Nebuchadnezzar exercises his authority. He casts them into the blazing fire, 321. The king with absolute authority chooses to deliver them. They don't have to answer. The king with absolute authority answered. Third account have Exodus, have that at the beginning of Daniel. You can look there at Daniel 6, just quickly. Similar to what's taking place, except this time it's Daniel Darius, the den of lions, because of a statute enacted declaring, you can only make petition to the king, not to your gods. Fourth account, Acts 4. Now it's the apostles. 
Peter and John are summoned in Acts 4, 18 and commanded there not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to give you heed, give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge of that. But we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And they're released and they continue to preach. And if we left it there, though, where we see those resisting authority because they're submitting to the highest authority and they sort of live and go on their way, I think it would be an inaccurate picture of what always takes place because those guys are going to eventually lay down their life for the gospel. And it's going to be governing authorities that's going to cut off the head of Paul who wrote Romans 13, 1 here. And it's going to be governing authorities that are going to crucify Peter's wife first so he can watch, and is forced to watch, and then crucify him after that. Paul says, submit, Romans 13, 1, and yet there are all these accounts of believers who didn't submit. Why? Because when the governing authority conflicts with the absolute authority, the believer must submit to the absolute authority. That's faith. And you need only look to that book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, that bears witness that faithful Christians have understood throughout history that civil authorities do not possess absolute authority and that only he who possesses absolute authority commands absolute submission, even when that punishment from the civil authorities is, this is going to require your life. So think about the big picture that's taking place here throughout the book of Romans, where all of the book of Romans has brought us to this morning. It's the gospel that frees you to submit to governing authorities, where you once were wrestling and almost prevented to because you were a slave of sin, of pride, of anger, of self-centeredness, of lack of self-control, of bitterness. So the gospel frees you to be able to submit to the governing authorities. But it's also the gospel that frees you to submit absolutely to God when doing so may require your life from those same civil authorities who see your refusal to them as a refusal to submit to their authority. It frees you because you're not like an unbeliever. You need not fear death. You need not fear death. The gospel frees you to lay down your life. It frees you in such a way because you've been forgiven. And and you can be sure that the God who you were dying in submission to is the God in whose presence you will be in the moment this life ends because he saved you through his son. You're free to die. I think Paul is preparing them for that in this text. We'll look at this a bit more next week, but here's where I would just urge you to consider your heart, Christian. A heart where the flesh is tempting us to refuse to submit and to resist authority in all sorts of areas in our life. That appears to be on Paul's mind so much so that he takes time to write these words, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those which exist have been appointed by God. Certainly when you think about that wrestling within you, within Nebuchadnezzar's reign, going back to Daniel once again, it's filled with other godless decrees coming from this pagan king, but it's Daniel who says that there was one, only one, this didn't happen over and over and over and over again, it doesn't seem to be the case. There was only one where the three men refused to submit And they were ready, and they were called to lay down their life to follow the absolute authority. How many other times in the normal, ordinary course of their lives did they submit because the king of heaven had appointed that king to be the king over them? Think about this. Within the society in which we live, and that you've been called to live, a society that's founded upon resisting authority, and within a culture of a state known for the phrases, don't mess with and come and take it. Paul's instruction in Romans 13, 1 may be more applicable than we might think at first glance. Add to that, you now come and live in an election year, and he's calling us, watch your transformed heart. Add to that, you live amidst voices within the church pushing a variety of brands of Christian nationalism. Christian, watch your heart. Where is your king going to come from? 
Add to that you're a few years removed from cities burning in protest. And add to that that we live in a day and age in which everyone has a microphone and a platform and on social media, and it's easy to speak. Everybody has a platform so you can speak about your resistance to whatever the authorities are saying. And you also now live in a culture where the civil authorities issue proclamations directing citizens to exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Will you know when to resist? Will you resist everything? Will you resist nothing? So here's my question. Will you be willing to submit to God, the absolute authority, when submitting to Him means we submit to His Word that's instructing you to submit to the governing authorities? Will that be the ordinary, normal, regular But nonetheless, extraordinary response of our lives revealing the transforming work of the gospel. Because doing so is going to find you walking in faith. Doing so is going to find the new believer looking at the older believer who's yielding to Romans 13.1. And the world is going to be looking at you and is going to see a heart transformed by grace by what you do and you don't do. Social media, speaking, actions by what you do say, don't say, in regards to those who occupy positions of authority over you. It's going to show the world where your hope lies, in what authority. In, in this, I think this is going to be preparing us as Christians. This heart demonstrating and growing in faith in the small and ordinary and regular areas of life will also be maturing So that if it comes to the moment where you're called to lay down your life, because what the absolute authority says conflicts with what the one given authority by him says, then you're ready to die in faith because you've matured in submitting. And if all you've ever done is resist, 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 it looks like that person's powerful and that's the person that's ready to die, but they've become a master of resisting. When, when they're called to lay down their life because they have to submit to God, will they be ready for that? I think the one whose life ordinarily, regularly demonstrates what Paul is saying here, that's the one ready. That's the one ready to submit to the absolute authority when it means laying down your life. This is the transforming power of the gospel, causing us to walk in faith, submitting to those in authority over us. One last biblical illustration I want to give you in closing. It's an illustration showing you, and I think this is why it's necessary, that your redemption was forged upon being in subjection to the governing authorities. Turn to John 19. This is the account that precedes the verses we looked at last week. John 19 here, Jesus has been scourged. He's been sent back before the crowds. Pilate says he's found no guilt in him. What did the Jews say? We have a law. And by that law, he ought to die because he's made himself out to be the son of God. John 19, 8. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid, and he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, remember the second half of Romans 13, 1. You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. The authority that belongs to Pilate in that moment was given him from above. Jesus recognizes where that authority came from and Jesus is submitting to it. The one who could have Call down legions of angels, Matthew 26, 53, he doesn't do it. He submits to that authority. He submits to the divine authority, the plan of redemption, the will of the absolute authority who has providentially designed it in such a way that he's placed Pilate in this position and that he's going to issue the wicked decree of execution and that that decree that he's going to execute, to, execute, to, to kill Jesus, this is what's ultimately going to be used for good, your good to redeem a people that belong to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. You have life today 
because Jesus chose to submit and to take up the cross to go and die for his people in the divine plan of God. So there's a profound and divine and striking beauty that's often not talked about that's radiating in submission. It's radiating with the power of the gospel and the submission here of the king going about the work of the gospel. And it's that same beauty Paul is saying in Romans 13 is to be found in the people of the king, even as they live as sojourners on earth in submission that shows forth faith in God for the glory of God. Father, thank you for your word that convicts and corrects. Thank you that you reign supreme and that that truth is revealed from Scripture so that as we look at the world around us, we can understand without hesitation that you have absolute authority. And whether the rulers and authorities are good or evil, they exist in the place in which they've been called to exist as long as you would have them to. So there is no need for the people of God to panic. And there is no need to, for the people of God to act like there is no absolute authority. I pray, Father, that you would help us to live in faith in the time in which you've called us to live, that you would give us discernment as to what we are to obey and what we are to resist, and that we would always be found faithfully in subjection to the absolute authority over all things. Father, I pray for those that are lost here this morning that have rejected your authority their entire lives and who have been blind and who cannot hear your truth. Maybe, Father, would you, would you give them life this morning so that they would be able to hear the truth that you have absolute and total authority, you have spoken in your word, and that they can have life through your Son, Jesus Christ, not by doing and trying to live a good and godly and righteous life, Text is clear, can't earn my own righteousness. It's all by grace. Would you direct them to Christ this morning? Would you give them a hope? Would you show them how they can be free from their pride, their sin, all the other things that come under the title sin of lusting, coveting? Father, would you just show them that freedom is found through Christ And would he be exalted in their heart? Would you draw them to Christ this morning? As a result of that, would that be a life then that lives in submission to, to God as the ultimate authority, the absolute authority? So humble us all, we pray, Lord. Humble the believers to conform to what your word is calling us to here. Humble the lost to come to Christ this morning. And may all of that bring glory to your name. Amen.